Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, I'd also like to thank Carla for our share. I, um, I always love listening to Carla. And, you know, part of the reason why I'm here today, I believe, is that it's the ripple effect from uh, uh, the one and only time that I've been to the USA in, in real life. I had the privilege of attending the Rule 62 Rendezvous in Bismarck, North Dakota, and I know that there's one or two uh, from North Dakota in the room. And uh, at that event, I had the pleasure and the privilege of meeting Dawn and also hearing Dawn and also hearing Carla. And here I am, thanks to Zoom. Um, amazing. And, you know, um, I've been asked to share on uh, on Step 2, and I will share my experience, strength, and hope around Step 2, which states, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I, I'm talking to you from a, a town called East Cobride, which is just outside of Glasgow in Scotland, and as I am beginning to speak with you, I'm very conscious that there is a power greater than me at play outside my window because there is a storm. It's got an Irish name, Brendan. It's called Aiden. Storm Aiden is currently uh, battering us. And um, it was quite something to listen to uh, in the wee half hour break there. Um, and I'm also you know, conscious that um, the principle behind step two um, actually, in my view, sums up all that Alcoholics Anonymous has, has faced and has dealt with the last seven months, you know, because we we ha- we faced a power greater than ourselves, the COVID-19 virus, which is uh, still with us, sadly. Um, we, uh, we had no control over the authorities' response to that. And yet what Alcoholics Anonymous did autonomously um, and uh, very quickly across the globe was that we rose up uh, in order to restore ourselves to wholeness uh, across the world, in order that we could continue to fulfil all our traditions, and especially, as uh, Carla referred to, Tradition 5, to carry this message to alcoholics across the globe. And at this point, I know that there are people in the room who are either new or are just coming back, and I say to you, welcome. And I also want to say to you, please, please, please do not judge Alcoholics Anonymous and what you're about to hear from this crazy Scotsman, okay? I am just an ex-drunk who has had, who has got the privilege of uh, spending an hour staring at 25 faces on my, uh, my laptop screen and my living room table. Uh, I beg of you, please stay for the rest of the event. I, I personally am so looking forward to hearing Georgia and Steve and Larsine and then I'll be returning tomorrow for uh, for Darren and Hilda and Marty and Polly. Um, and I hope that I've remembered everybody. Please forgive me, my fellow speakers, if uh, if I've forgotten you. And, um, and of course, today is October the 31st, and there's a couple of things that I want to say. First of all, when I realised it was October the 31st, Halloween, I asked Dawn if it meant that I could, you know, come in fancy dress. And uh, we had a laugh about it, but um, he reminded me of the the importance of the event and that although we are not a glum lot, uh, that um, I should suit up and show up. And that's what I've done. But this is actually the closest I get to fancy dress now, because who would have believed at the beginning of this year that the only time that I actually have to or get to wear a shirt and tie and a jacket is to sit in my living room talking to all of you on a laptop on my uh, on my dining room table, you know, um, I had mischievously and whimsically thought that as uh, Darren from Australia, and I share the same surname, that perhaps we could have dressed up as the Blues Brothers, as we more, both most certainly are on a mission from God. But um, no, that was uh, that was shot down. But I'm very very glad to be here, and uh, grateful to be sober. Uh, and be with all of you. And I'm trying not to look at the numbers of participants that are now in the room. It's increasing uh, with every passing minute. 
I'm just trying to focus on one or two faces in the room and not think about the fact that there are so many people that I'm, I'm now got the responsibility to to share with on on and around step two. I'd like to welcome all my uh, my fellow Scots uh, who have come across, and uh, my other friends from all across the globe who have. Uh, come here seemingly to listen to me. I mean, I have to say, guys, are you restored to sanity? You know, if that's what you're doing on a Saturday evening as it is here. Um, the other reason that I want to just mention October the 31st, of course, is because we uh, we lost one of our leading lights um, just a few weeks ago, and um, Clancy Emisland would have been 62 years sober today. Um, and I think that as we go through the rest of this weekend, just please let's just think about Clancy, because as the, this is the first year since 1959 where we have not been able to mark his sober anniversary um, with him alive. But I do feel that um, wherever he is just now in the big meeting in the sky, that I would like to think that he's able to look down upon us and, you know, and uh, he's probably saying to himself, who is this Scottish puke? that they've invited to come and share at Mount Baker, you know. But um, I feel very um, strongly the sense of responsibility on my shoulders to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, and I will try and do that to the best of my ability. But I have to say to you also that, you know, on this day, October the 31st, as a, as a true and proud Scot, despite my name, and I'll come back to my name, I am sad. You know, there is a, a pall of sadness settled on upon me because as many of you will know who follow the news, um, perhaps the most famous Scot, certainly one of the most famous Scots of the last 50, 60 years, passed away at the age of 90, Sean Connery. Uh, and that saddened me today. Um, I, I never met the man, but he, uh, he inspired me um, for the last 50, 60 years. And um, I'm sure that there are many fans of him as uh, James Bond and many other roles in the room. And I hope that you'll understand that uh, perhaps I'm not going to be as jovial as I might otherwise have been because it's it's weighing heavily in my heart that we've lost him today. Um, I told you my sobriety date. Um, I, uh, I did not, however, embrace Alcoholics Anonymous in the programme of recovery way back in 1984. Um, I only drank for nine years, in fact, and uh, I'm going to share um, a good bit of my experience, strength and hope with you, with uh, step two, of course, being the focus of my share, because really step two um, came to believe that power of gift in ourselves could restore us to sanity. That has basically been the story of my life, um, and I'll share that with you to the best of my ability for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes or so. Um, my full name is Ivor Davis, and uh, you don't have to be a student of Scottish culture uh, to know that that is not particularly a Scottish name. You know, Scottish names that you might be more familiar with are uh, Robert Burns, um, William Wallace, Craig Ferguson. Um, uh, my name is much more Welsh in origin, and um, I never, I, I, I never used to like my name. I wish that I had a different name for a long, long time in my childhood and adolescence and even in my adulthood. Uh, but nevertheless, I had a very happy childhood. My mother and father were pillars of the local community, so much so that when my mum and then my dad passed away, they had full-page spreads in the local newspaper. They were, they were really good people. Um, and I would say that it's only in recent years, thanks to the programme of recovery, and I'll call it anonymous, that I have... Uh, become the son that I believe that they always hoped and wished and wanted me to be. Um, and that's largely thanks to their example, which I took a long while to uh, recognise and follow. I have a sponsor, and he knows he's my sponsor. And no pressure, but he's in the room as well. Um, I have uh, the privilege um, over many years of uh, sponsoring other people through this 12-step programme. And some of them are in the room as well. So again, no pressure. Um, but, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has enabled me now to live my very best life. Uh, and I couldn't always have said that. So going back to the beginning, I come from a place called Balach, 
Many of you, although you've maybe not visited uh, Scotland, may have heard of the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. And uh, Balloch is right at the mouth of Loch Lomond. And that's where I spent my first 20 years. And it was, um, for the most part, a very happy childhood. Uh, something, however, happened um, in my adolescence. And I can't go back to the 1970s and put a, a pin on the calendar and say that's the day it all changed. But at some point at the age of 12, 13, 14, fear came into my life in a huge way. Uh, I had no idea what was going on. And although I was aware that I was quite a strange little boy, and this was accentuated by the fact that my mother often, long before I took a drink, would look at me and she would shake her head and she would say, I don't know where I got you. And she would also say to me, why can you not be like the other boys? You know, and then she would say to me things that really, really frightened me. And she didn't mean this. She didn't mean to uh, cause me stress or upset, but she would say things to me like, oh, Ivor, your school years are the happiest years of your life. And by this time at 13, 14, I'm waking up in the morning to go to secondary school, high school, as you might better know over there. And uh, I am full of fear and I can't put my finger on it, but my head would race off at 100 miles an hour, fearing all the things that were going to happen, worrying about that essay that I'd done, which just did not match my perfectionist standards and which I was sure was going to be the subject of extreme criticism from my teacher, worrying about that girl that I fancied. What if she spoke to me? What if she even looked at me? And my head would just race off at 100 miles an hour and I had no idea what was going on. My name... The fact that my name was so different, and it's so different, by the way, that in 36 years, I have still to meet another Ivor in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, that did not uh, that did not help my uh, terminal uh, uniqueness sensations, I'll tell you. Um, but uh, my name did not make me an alcoholic. But later on, when I developed alcoholism, it certainly contributed to the feeling of apartness, being different from uh, that certainly was the case for me. Um, and, you know, I had my first encounter with Step 2 uh, when I was 16 because I discovered a power greater than myself and it restored me to sanity. It, was, it took away all these feelings of fear and anxiety and neurosis and apartness. Um, and that power greater than myself was called alcohol. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but that is my experience. My mother and father were not drinkers. There was no act of alcoholism in any of my immediate family. Later on, when I investigated my family tree a little bit more in depth and shook it, there were a few flu fell out. But certainly my mother and father were not alcoholics. They barely drank at all. In fact, when I came to survey the options for my first drink at the age of 16, and I was a late starter, um, the options in the cupboard were a couple of cans of beer, a half bottle of Grouse or Bell's Whiskey, a bottle of Warnick's Advocat. I don't even know if you have that over there. It's an eggy mess. It's yellow. Uh, and it used to be best drunk with lemonade. And that was my mother's only tipple if she drank at all at Christmas or New Year. And then there was a bottle of um, supermarket Australian sherry, and Darren, if you're in the room, I'm sure this never saw Australia, but that's what it said on the label. And um, I quickly surmised, even before I took my first drink, that the best option for me was going to be this bottle of Australian sherry. Why? Because it was in a coloured bottle, either green or brown glass, and I knew that whatever was about to happen, I was going to be able to conceal from my mum and dad that I had drank at all because I would be able to fill up this bottle with water. So I'm already thinking, it turns out, alcoholically, planning um, to conceal my drinking even before I've taken the first drink. And my first drink was a slug, a glug, out of this bottle of Australian sherry. And my first thoughts, not having had any real insight into what alcohol was all about, as this stuff passed my lips, was this is disgusting. Because trust me, it was. It tasted horrible. 
In actual fact, as I digress just for a moment, it was to become my experience that for the next nine years that I never actually liked the taste of alcohol. With one exception, bizarrely, I liked the aniseed taste of uh, pastis or ouzo. I don't get that. What I can tell you now at the age of 61 is that when I have to take medicine um, for uh, for reflux, you know, one of these things that you get when you get older, I choose, I willingly choose the aniseed flavour. I don't know what that's about. But anyway, as I said, I digress. I drank for effect. And, you know, and once that, um, that first slug of Australian sherry went down my throat and hit my stomach, oh, my God. In an instant, and I can even even now, forty four years, forty five years after I had that experience, sharing it with you right now, I can still remember the sensation. It was such a profound sensation it had on me, because you see, for the three or four years before that first drink, I hope I've conveyed to you that I had become a very shy, introverted, anxious, fearful adolescent. I had I had virtually no friends. I found it very difficult to mix. And this alcohol that I had just put into my system just took away all those feelings, took them all away. And I immediately thought, I can't wait to let people see this new Ivor. I cannot wait to let them see the effect that this stuff has on me. I didn't know that nine years later, this alcohol was going to come back like a boomerang, as Bill Wilson described it. Um, and uh, tear me to shreds. I had no idea, but right there on that in that day at that moment, I knew that I was going to I was going to develop a relationship with this stuff because it made me feel whole. It made me feel really good, and that's what I started to do. Um, the fact that I was underage um, inhibited my drinking to some extent for the first two years. Um, but uh, I can remember going to a school disco. Uh, must have been when I was 16, pushing 17. And um, I went into uh, an off-license, as we call it, um, in uh, in Alexandria, a town near Tabalach. And I went into the most horrible off-license, a place that I, I just would not be seen dead in. This place literally had sawdust on the floor. And I went into this place and I bought two cans of Guinness and a quarter bottle of Black Heart rum. Now, I don't know whether you know these drinks at all, but uh, Guinness is um, hails from Ireland and is a very dark beer with a white head. And um, Black Heart Rum was a very dark rum. And the reason why I chose these drinks to ask in, uh, for in the shop was that back in the 1970s, there was an advertising campaign for Black Heart Rum, which was set in the Middle Ages, and it featured a rather buxom barmaid. And that was me sold. I bought this quarter bottle of Black Heart Rum in the back of that. Guinness, I always liked the look of it. and um, But let me tell you, Guinness in cans was absolutely disgusting. But I took this alcohol and I went into somebody's back court. That's the back close where the bins are kept. And I drank those two cans of Guinness. And then I chased it down down my throat with a quarter bottle of black heart rum. And it all tasted horrible. But, you know, I could get that feeling. I got that effect. And I can remember literally bouncing along the road to my school where the disco was. And I remember going in. And I heard a teacher saying, look at the state of Ivor. And I took that as a compliment. You know, they were seeing the new me, and I liked this. And, you know, I went into that school disco, and one of those girls that I had fancied for probably four years at this point but could not bring myself even to say hello to, I went straight up to her with this Dutch courage inside me, and I asked her to dance. And we danced. And let me tell you, I have never been a good dancer. I'm even worse now with the state of my knees at the age of 61. But I, um, uh, when we were dancing, and I use the term very loosely, on the dance floor, she was laughing. She was having a great time, I thought. She was actually laughing at me. I've, I've no doubt about that today. But in my head, I have arrived. You know, this is great. I'm part of, you know, and it's all down to alcohol. And um, I had many, many happy times in my early days of drinking. The more eagle-eyed amongst you will see that over my shoulder, there is a picture on the wall of the Incredible Hulk. 
And some of you in the room may even have been or may still be Marvel comic fans. Uh, certainly the movies of the last 20 years have expanded the audience for uh, for Marvel Comics. I was a Marvel Comics buff from when I was a wee boy. And, you know, part of the reason why I know now that I identified so much with the Hulk and also with Spider-Man and many of the other uh, creations of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby was that with the Hulk, um, gamma rays bombarded Bruce Banner and turned them into this uh, super-powered human being. And um, alcohol was my superpower. Alcohol transformed me. Um, And for a while, it transformed me in a good way. But, you know, very early on, even probably by the age of 18, uh, I was experiencing other effects of alcohol that I did not understand and I did not like. But because of the limitations of my age and uh, the fact that I was still staying at home, uh, my drinking, you know, was still limited to a Friday or a Saturday night. But over the next few years, all those limitations came off. And, you know, when I look back on it now, um, I can see that I went from only drinking on a Friday or Saturday night to then only drinking at night to then when I went to university, there was was always a good reason, I thought, to drink. And, um, you know, whether it was a political campaign that was getting launched in the bar or um, I had a good mark in an essay, or I really took a resentment towards a tutor who pulled me up in a tutorial. Um, Suddenly, drink is my constant companion. And um, I chased that feeling, that feeling that I described to you when I got my first drink, I chased that for the next nine years, and I never quite got it. And it didn't matter what I drank, where I drank, how much I drank, who I drank with, I never quite got that feeling. And I didn't understand, of course, that alcoholism is a progressive illness which has a physical component. And the physical component, as Carla so eloquently described, is that when I put alcohol into my system, I trigger off a compulsion over which I have no control. I had no idea about this back then. But it was my experience that even when I promised myself and others that I'm just going to have one or maybe two, I had no idea that as soon as I put alcohol into my system, I was triggering off this compulsion that told, that then led me to take four, six, eight, twelve, sixteen. You know, I had no idea that blackouts were a common symptom of the active illness of alcoholism. But what was happening was that I was experiencing them. And the first time I thought all my drinking buddies were uh, playing a joke on me because they told me the next day that after drinking several pints of beer, that I had inexplicably moved on to perno. There's that aniseed connection again. I had moved on to perno and blackcurrant, of all things, and that I was up on the tables in the bar dancing. I was chatting up a barmaid who was twice my age and inviting her to come home with me. You know, I had no recollection of any of these things. In fact, the only evidence that suggested that they might be telling me the truth the next morning was when I discovered that somebody, wasn't me, I thought, somebody had vomited in my waste paper basket in my bedroom and it smelled very clearly of perno and blackcurrant, you know. Um, So when I began to piece this little facts together and I realised that things were happening that I didn't understand, they disturbed me momentarily, but, you know, I just thought... That's what happens in the west of Scotland. The west of Scotland is a very machismo, macho drinking culture. It certainly did then. And I thought, well, that's what must happen. We we do crazy things. We drink. We, we get mad with it. And, you know, all kinds of wacky things happen. And I just carried on my merry way. But, you know, as I, as I moved on to, and I left school and I went to university, my drinking, as I said, became more serious. You know, Bill Wilson talks about his drinking uh, became more serious proportions, and uh, certainly that 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 became my experience too. Somewhere along the way, uh, not unsurprisingly, very very drunk uh, at a party, I met a girl who was to become my wife, and with whom we had three wonderful children, all of whom are now older than I was when I stopped drinking. And let me tell you, just as a wee sidebar, that over the years I have watched uh, scrupulously to see if the genetic element of alcoholism has been passed on to any of my children. So far, he said, touching wood, 
Uh, there is no evidence that any of them have uh, have developed alcoholism. They, they they all enjoy a drink, but they can they can do things like start drinking bottles of beer and leave beer in the glass. They can have a glass of wine and not even finish it. You know, I I could not do that. You know, I just could not do that. It was just not my experience. So I met this girl um, who was to become my wife, and uh, within weeks we had moved in together, and within weeks of that, um, I met her parents. And I mention this because it's significant in the sense that when I met her dad, even at the age of 21, I could see that this man was, in my view, a real alcoholic. What I mean by that is that he was drinking bottles of vodka and whiskey. He had bottles hidden in his lorry. He had bottles hidden in the garage. He was virtually a topped-up drunk. But, you know, as a 21-year-old, I had moments of clarity, and I could see so many similarities in his behavior. Later on, the big book described the peculiar mental twist that preceded the first drink. And I could see so many similarities between me and him, even though in comparison to him, I was just an embryonic alcoholic. I thought, well, if, if his daughter, my girlfriend, if she makes the connection, then my drinking might be in trouble. So for the last four years of my drinking, I became ever more secretive. Um, ever more devious, so much so that when um, uh, Carol did find me in 1984 uh, in some state after a drinking session, it really was the first sign that she had seen of how bad my drinking had become. So you see, I did have these moments of clarity where I knew that there was something not right with my drinking, and this carried on through my time at university, and I, I gravitated towards drinking with guys who were older than me because they seemed to like a good drink. They were, in the big book's description, heavy drinkers. Now, what I mean by that is I could be sitting in a bar, and there's a famous bar in Glasgow called Tenant's Bar, and I could be sitting in Tenant's Bar with these guys of a Saturday afternoon, maybe around this time, in fact, and uh, we'd be discussing politics or uh, football or women or a mixture of all of the above. And uh, these guys are there for the day. They, these guys are going to sink a few pints, but I'm with them, and they're not drinking fast enough for me. And I'm, I'm nodding and shaking my head at the appropriate point in the conversation, but my head is screaming, will you please just shut up? I wasn't being as polite as that, though. Will you please just shut up and get around it? And, uh, and then I had the great idea. I realized that Tenant's Bar um, had a door outside the bathroom. You could go into the toilet and then go out another door, out into the street, and walk round into the uh, Byers Road in the west end of Glasgow, and you could go down into what was then called the Safari Lounge. And you could go down into the Safari Lounge, and I could order a half pint and a half, and I could go down and neck that, and then go back up, go to the toilet, so that I could be honest with the guys and say that I've been to the toilet, and then I could resume the company. And even though they might still be talking for another half hour, the fact that I had that wee charge from uh, the beer and the whiskey just enabled me to just calm that voice down in my head that was so disgruntled about their lack of uh, foresight and consideration of me and my needs. Um, it just gave me enough to be getting on with. And I did this time after time after time, and I never thought there was anything wrong with it. It was their fault. They just weren't drinking quick enough. They weren't getting around it. Um, and this was to become the pattern for my last three, four years of my drinking. And I didn't see it coming. It crept up on me. You know, I identify so much with Bill's story in that sense that, you know, we can see the progression of the illness, uh, the progression of his drinking from 1929, especially through until 1934. Um, I identify with that lots. But I'm a I'm a young guy, and um, I don't see there's really as a problem with my drinking. Uh, even though you know when I do have these moments of clarity, I'm thinking there's something just not quite right here. And at the age of 21, I came into contact with a man who was in this fellowship, a man called Matt. And the significance of Matt is that he placed the seeds that were later to flower. Um, and I needed them a few years later because Matt, 
for reasons that I don't know to this day, other than assuming that he saw something in me, he smelled my breath, he saw the fact that I always had drink in me. This man, Matt, told me that he was a member of a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous and that he stayed away from one drink for one day at a time for oneself. And he told me a whole bunch of other stuff about fellowships and higher powers and programs. But back then, as a 21-year-old, I just archived it, to use a computer term. I just archived it at the back of my brain, and I just carried on my merry way. Uh, so I, I leave university. I managed to get a degree, even though, again, I identify with Bill and Bill's story that um, uh, uh, an alloy of uh, drink and pro-plus caffeine tablets got me through my exams, um, and I managed to get a degree took a resentment against the university because they hadn't recognised true genius. I got an honours degree, but they didn't give me the, the class of degree that my ego felt that I deserved, and I, I drank in that resentment, certainly for the last couple of years of my, uh, of my drinking. After a period of unemployment, I got a job, and uh, although the unemployment had hindered and impeded my drinking just through lack of finance, once I got, I started working in July 1983, that really marked the beginning of the last phase of my drinking, and it just went off the scale. I would go um, for a pint. I was always just going for a pint with the guys uh, in the bar after work. And, you know, I believe that at the point where I decided that I'm just going to have one or maybe two, I believe that I could have passed a lie detector test. You know, but see, once I got that drink inside me, of course, I've no knowledge of the compulsion, the phenomenon of craving that develops when I take a, when I take a drink of alcohol. And it was like my feet were nailed to the floor and I couldn't move. And night after night, I was in the bar until closing time. My girlfriend didn't realize the extent of this because she was working long hours in the hotel and catering trade. And um, I got into the well-worn routine of being able to sober myself up sufficiently in order to maintain the lie that when she came home that I'd only had one or two or maybe three or four, um, when in fact the numbers were considerably more than that. And um, I began to experience what my friend and fellow group member, Olivia, calls brownouts. And a brownout is when I can remember being in the bar, I can remember being in the bus, I can remember climbing the stairs to my Glasgow tenement flat and I can remember putting frozen pizzas on under the grill, but the rest of the night is gone. You know, the bits in between, I, I, I don't know. It's just I'm getting these little snippets. Um, and this worked very well for a long, long time and I was able to soak up the alcohol with the uh, the food, the pizzas, sufficiently that I could maintain this lie when Carol came home that I only had had a few and that worked until it failed spectacularly. And it failed spectacularly in May of 1984. And um, I can remember uh, getting home and I can remember putting the pizzas on under the grill. And then the next thing that I know is Carol's face is right in my face and she's crying and she's screaming at me. She's absolutely screaming at me and there's smoke everywhere. And what had happened was I had come home and put the pieces around the grill doing the well-worn routine, and this time it didn't work because I conked out. I was so intoxicated uh, that I passed out on the bed, still wearing my, my, uh, my suit from work. And fortunately, that night, Carol came home 10 minutes earlier uh, than she normally would have. Um, and I don't exaggerate that, you know, but um, if she hadn't come home early that night, you would have a different speaker right now because so many people who um, die in flat fires, it's not the fire, it's the it's the smoke inhalation that gets them. And the flat was full of smoke, let me tell you. So much so that the next morning, and I'm going to cut out all the swear words, you can fill them in yourself. The next morning, and I'm so grateful to her, and I have been for many years, she gave me an ultimatum. The next morning, she said to me, listen, you, I have lived with my dad all my life who's an alcoholic. If you have got a problem with your drinking, you better sort it out now. Otherwise, we are finished. You will be out in your ear. The holiday, which was planned for two months hence, will be off. The wedding, which was already arranged, will be off next year. Um, so if you've got a problem, you better deal with it. Uh, and she really did not miss me and hit the wall. 
And the fact that I could have died last the, the night before, the fact that how did that happen? Because, you know, I just I just wanted to have a pint or two with the guys at work. How did this happen? It all terrified me. The prospect of her finishing things with me absolutely terrified me. What am I going to do? And then I remembered what we Matt had told me those years previously. And, you know, I knew that I could stay off drink for a day. I had managed it for one day or two days or three days on occasion after a particularly bad session. So I thought, that's what I need to do. I can't contemplate not drinking for the rest of my life, but I can do it one day at a time. And that's what I started to do. And that then began the second longest period of my sobriety to date because I managed to stay away from one drink for one day at a time uh, through gritted teeth willpower. Uh, for 60 days, and it was not a happy a happy period of my life, let me tell you. And, you know, and I made it even worse because, you know, when I went back to work, um, I'm still going to the bar with the guys at work, and I'm I'm drinking pints of Coca-Cola. I'm even drawing their attention to it, saying, I'm drinking pints of Coke, you know, see, guys, you know. And um, and they're saying, Ivor, what are you doing? And I would say, oh, um, well, you know, I had a bit of an incident last week, and I think I'm an alcoholic. And and they're going, what? Away you go. You're not even 25. How can you possibly be an alcoholic? But I carried on uh, with my abstinence for the 60 days because, you see, I was terrified that um, Carol would carry out her threat to finish things with me. I'd become quite dependent upon her, apart from anything else. And, um, you know, my mind back then was that I forgot you know, I forgot how bad things had been in the flat fire in May 1984. And uh, by the time July 1984 comes around and we're on that holiday, we're on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean and it's July and it is absolutely baking hot. And um, I no longer really think that I could possibly be an alcoholic. I mean, because alcoholics are the guys, that are the, the down and outs in the park, right? You know, I'm 25 and I've got a really good job and I've got this beautiful wife to be and I've got a lovely flat and, you know, I can't possibly be alcoholic. And, you know, Carol inadvertently um, amplified this voice in my head because by the time we're in Crete after uh, 60 days, she's now saying to me, you know, I'm really proud of you. You've done so well. Um, don't you think that you could just have a wee glass of wine, though? I, it's just not the same for me, just having a glass of wine. I would far rather be sharing a bottle of wine with you. And at first I'm resisting and I'm saying, no, no, darling, I'm fine. You carry on. I'm OK with my Pepsi Cola. But, you know, the voice inside my head was getting louder and louder and louder. You know, she's right, Ivor. You know, you, you've done well. You deserve a drink. And, you know, added to this, and, you know, later on in the book, it talks about resentment being the number one offender. And I can relate to that because all the time that I'm on holiday as a 25-year-old man, there was this older guy in our company. He stayed in the same hotel as us, and he's probably about the same age as I am now. And this guy was needling me the whole holiday because what I heard him saying at every opportunity was, oh, are you still on the Pepsi Cola, Ivor? You know, fancy a real man's drink. And the resentment in my head is building up and building up. And I'm thinking, see, if I drank, I'd bloody show you. I would drink you under the table, mate. So this resentment, coupled with this thought that uh, I can't possibly be alcoholic, led to the inevitable. And one day I'm out and it's a beautiful lunchtime and we're having Greek salad and moussaka and a taverna. And this day, instead of ordering an ouzo for Carol and a Pepsi for me, I ordered two ouzos. And I can remember Carol saying, oh, will you be all right? And I'm saying, yeah, 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 I'll be fine. I didn't know I was going to be fine, but I just said that anyway. But, you know, cunning, baffling and powerful is how alcohol is described in the big book. Because, you see, that day, that lunchtime, I had two ouzos and I stopped didn't have the raging compulsion to carry on the rest of the afternoon. Nothing terrible happened. The sky didn't fall on me. In fact, Carol is delighted because me, with two drinks of alcohol in my system, I relaxed. I became much better company than I'd been for the 60 days. I was like a coiled spring, you know, without alcohol in my system. So suddenly I've relaxed. I'm able to converse. I'm able to joke. You know, I'm able to, you know, talk about the fact that we're going to really enjoy the next few days of the holiday. 
Um, and I have convinced myself that I can't possibly be alcoholic. What I didn't know, but what was my experience the next day was that I had, in fact, set off the compulsion, but it was like on a short fuse, I'm oh, sorry, a long fuse. Because the next day, when I started to drink, and all I wanted to do was enjoy some of the Greek um, alcohol that I had deprived myself of for the 10 days. I just wanted to enjoy, you know, more ouzo. I wanted to enjoy Ritzina and Raki and Metaxa Brandy. I just wanted to just enjoy the drinks that I'd seen others drinking with impunity. Um, but what happened was that when I started to drink the next night, I could not stop. It really was like my body took over and it demanded the whole, not just the 10 days, but it demanded the whole 60 days supply that I had deprived it of. And um, at some point, I can remember Carol kicking me very hard under the table on the shins. And she saying to me, do you not think you've had enough? And another reason that the Hulk is up in the wall behind me is that he is my portrayal of my inner Mr. Hyde and my inner Mr. Hyde, my incredible Hulk came out and I turned on her. And I said, this is what you wanted. You know, it was all her fault. And I was on my merry way uh, drinking as much as I possibly could. Eric, by the way, the guy who had been needling me, I said something to him. I, I Even a day afterwards, I don't know what I said to him, but I just know it wasn't very nice. And he disappeared off into the night, leaving this nutter with his booze. I couldn't, when I had the moment of clarity late on and I'm on my own with all these glasses and bottles, I couldn't go and put pizzas on under the grill. Um, and I tried to sober myself up by drinking lots and lots of soft drinks, lots of lemonade, for example. But I was so intoxicated that I couldn't even break the seals on the bottle. And uh, I brought a catering knife into play to try and break the seals. And all that happened with the catering knife and me being so drunk was that I stabbed myself in my hand. And I can remember basically a geezer of blood shooting out my hand and then it was lights out. I uh, I passed out, fainted, conked out. And when I came to, in the early hours of the 21st of July, 1984, I was more terrified than I've ever been uh, until that point. I don't ever want to be that scared again because I sobered up enough to realise I could get those brownouts, there was bits of the night all came and crashed in on me and there's blood everywhere and I've got a thumping headache because I've cracked my head on the tiles in the shower and it's like, oh no, it's happened again. Oh my God. Um, Carol had gone off uh, for a walk to clear her head. Don't remember there being any big fight, but um, the next day I knew, I knew that I cannot take so much as one sip of alcohol. My only solution that I was able to apply from that day was reverting to just not drinking one day at a time. And that's what I did. And um, for the next two weeks, I was very ill physically, really, really ill. I, I had terrible withdrawal symptoms. I drank so much. But, you know, once I was back in Glasgow and I, uh, I cleared up physically and my head cleared up, I... Um, I began to enjoy life. I had what many will refer to as a, a pink cloud experience. And um, the following year, Carol and I did get married. But by that time, the pink cloud experience is beginning to evaporate and I'm restless, irritable and discontent, sober. And I don't know what's going on. Uh, my wedding day, I spoiled for my wife, not because I was choking for a drink, because you see, it's my experience that... Unbeknownst to me in July 1984, a power greater than me intervened and took away the desire, the obsession to drink there and then, and then just watched over me in all the subsequent years to make sure that I didn't do anything really stupid, dry, like kill myself, throwing myself in front of a train, driving my car very fast into a wall. These were fantasy ideas that I did have in subsequent years. But going back to my wedding day, although I wasn't thinking about a drink, I was so ill at ease in myself because, you see, before it nearly killed me, alcohol was my solution. And I now, I now no longer have this solution. And I am, I am that wee boy, the 14-year-old teenager that I described to you, who was full of fear, but it's tenfold. It's so much worse now. And I spoiled my wedding day because I dragged my wife away um, from just when the party was really getting started because I selfishly could not handle all the chit-chat and all the congratulations and, and just trying to smile and listen to everybody who was 
who were mostly under the influence, of course. And um, my wedding day actually marked the beginning of the the uh, the descent into alcoholism. Dry for me, um, although I had, I had no clue that was what was going on. And um, I threw myself into work. My solution to my living problem was to work harder and harder and harder. I became a badge-carrying workaholic. And the place where I worked, um, we became very successful at what we did, partly through my efforts, because I was working literally 60, 70, 80 hours a week in a contract that only required me to work 35. And... um, God put so many people in my path during this period. Between 1985 and 1987, the place that I worked became like AA Central. I'm not going to Alcoholics Anonymous, but my boss had been 12-stepping in this fellowship in 1983. The chairman was in the fellowship. The accountant and the treasurer were in the fellowship. There was a couple of guys in payroll were in AA. And then we employed this wee part-time alcohol and addiction counsellor called Archie G., and later I was discovered that, that Archie G was no less than a Glasgow AA legend. And this wee man would ask me questions every morning that drove me mad. He would come up to me and he would say, hey, big man, how's it going? How are you today? And I, I, I could not answer this because my head is just racing. My stomach is churning. Um, I, I just don't know how to communicate. Um, I am I am miserable. I am full of fear. And um, eventually, by October 1987, I'm terrified because I'm about to become a father for the first time. And um, my, uh, my now wife is now repeating what my mother used to do with me when I was a wee boy. She's now shaking her head and looking at me as I'm returning home, exhausted from a mentally and emotionally exhausting day at the office every single day. And she's saying to me, There's, you need to see somebody. There's something wrong with you. You need to, I don't know, psychiatrist, psychologist, you need to talk to somebody either because I can't put up with this much longer. And I had no idea what was wrong with me. Archie is telling me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going, but Archie, how can how I'm feeling have anything to do with alcoholism? I haven't had a drink for two years, three years. And he would just smile and he would say, son, alcohol comes in cans and bottles, but alcoholism comes in people. Eventually, I didn't know what else to do. Ten days before my first daughter was born, I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and... I got hope that night, and I got hope because the two women at the top table, who I can still remember, Helen A. and Elsie, they they talked about their feelings and their emotions. They talked about the peculiar mental twist preceding the first drink. They talked about the insanity of the first drink. They, They talked about their emotions in ways that I didn't know adult human beings could do. But most importantly of all, at this very first meeting at Albert Drive, Wednesday night, um, behind the speakers, there was a, a picture frame, and in this picture frame, it said, you are no longer alone. And I, I liked that. I was identifying with that. I didn't know that. But because I was 28 by this time, I'm three years and three months away from drink, and I had felt so, so alone for so long. And I began to think that very first night that maybe Archie wasn't such a crazy old man after all. And I began to come to Alcoholics Anonymous two or three times a week. My first daughter was born. Things got better at home. Things got better at work. Life in in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous going to meetings was infinitely better than me, myself, and I on my own out there. Um, But, you know, I was a very stupid and stubborn young man, too clever for his own good by far. And after a period of weeks or months of coming around the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I would look at the wall scrolls where you see the 12 steps and the 12 traditions up in the wall, and I would look at the steps and I would go, well, came to believe, um, or sorry, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable, step one. And I would recognize that and say, well, I, you know, I, I realized that I was uh, powerless over alcohol back in July 1984, but my life's not unmanageable now. Now that I'm coming to these meetings, well, my life is good. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got a big house. I've got now, you know, two children. Um, I've got a company car and I'm enjoying life. So therefore, when I looked at step two, 
came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, I didn't see the need for that for me. And anyway, restore me to sanity implied that I was insane, you know, and I'm not insane now. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying life, I thought. So that then gave me the, the get out of jail free card to then just disregard steps three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And I quite liked 12. I quite liked going out in 12 step calls, you know, going out in the middle of the night and huckling some alky and uh, telling them about Alcoholics Anonymous and giving them a, a starter pack and telling them about, about, about a big book and telling them where the meetings were. I quite enjoyed that. Um, made a complete pig's ear of uh, of amends as well, but I probably don't have time to go into that. Suffice to say, it is very, very important not to tell your significant other about some of your previous transgressions when you've not actually gone through the steps between one and eight with a sponsor. You know, because when I did that with my wife, it caused a huge rift, which was actually to drive a wedge in our relationship uh, and contributed to the breakup of that marriage several years later, I do believe. So basically what I'm saying to you is that in this period, and I'll call it anonymous between 1987 and 1995, I didn't see the need for me to um, even look at step two, far less move on to the other steps, which was just as well because step three terrified me. And if step three didn't terrify me, steps four and five absolutely did. Because I'd been carrying this secret around in my head since I was 19. Nobody was going to know this thing. So the idea of writing that out and then sharing it with another individual, far less this God, whatever this God was, um, no, I'm not doing that. So I just enjoyed being a member of the fellowship and coming to meetings. But I didn't know, you see, that alcoholism is a progressive illness. And it's my experience that it progressed in me even when I was not drinking because, you see, I wasn't treating it. For many, many years, the only part of this illness that I successfully treated was the physical side of this illness because I wasn't putting alcohol into my system. I didn't know that I needed to have a psychic change in order to recover from alcoholism. I didn't know that my thinking was still faulty, even though um, I no longer had recourse to the solution of alcohol. I didn't know that I was becoming sicker and sicker mentally and emotionally until I did. And what happened for me is that in 1995, I'm in a job that by this time I absolutely hate. Um, I'm only going to one meeting a week. I'm not really a member of Alcott's Anonymous. I am an attender. And I've got no acceptance. I've got no sponsor. Uh, the last guy that had asked to sponsor me when he told me that we, you know, that we, I might be ready for step three, and I said to him, Joe, what does that entail? And he said, Well, why don't you come over to my house and we'll have some dinner and we'll have a coffee and and then we'll go through to the lounge and we'll kneel down together on the rug and we'll say the step three prayer. I balked, you know that word and how it works, balked. I balked big time and I said to Joe, Joe, you know what? I've just remembered I've got stuff to do, blah, 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 blah. I'll be back in touch. And I never was back in touch with that man as a sponsor. Um, so by 1995, I'm only going to one meeting a week, and that's just the escape from this hideous uh, employment situation that I'm in. And then my solution to my living problem was to um, reacquaint myself with my friend, the Incredible Hulk, over my shoulder. And I decided that um, I was going to show them, and I was going to become the Richard Branson of the comic world in Scotland because I was going to set up a business, and I was going to become a successful comic book entrepreneur retailer. And I stuck two fingers up to the uh, the very well-paid public authority job that I was in. I took off the shirt and the tie and the suit. I grew my hair long because, yes, I did used to have hair. I put my earring back in and I started wearing cool T-shirts. And uh, I became a comic dude, you know, like the like comic book guy in The Simpsons, except without the yellow hue. And... Um, I never meant to stop coming to AA, but that's what happened. This was the, this this new venture became my great obsession, and I went a week without a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because you see I had no roots, I had no responsibilities, I had no home group. I went a month without a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went six months, ladies and gentlemen. I did not get back to Alcoholics Anonymous for eight years and two months, and in those eight years and two months completely unaware that I was suffering from an illness called alcoholism. I went off my head sober, 
start raving sobriety is what I experienced and everything that I held dear went during those eight years. Um, my marriage to that beautiful woman with whom by this time I've got three lovely kids, uh, that went. Uh, one morning she said to me, Ivor, I can't do this anymore. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I can't be married to you anymore. I said, why? I'm a good guy. I'm sober and I'm doing this. And she said, Ivor, you're a madman. I went, what? Later on, when I was to go through the book of Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor, I was to find myself um, in the big book where it describes uh, the alcoholic as being an extreme example of self war run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. And I didn't think so. I did not think so. But that was that was my experience. That business that I threw myself into, although I was very, very good at customer service, I was hopeless at running a business. And um, with the breakup of my marriage, I just could, I literally could not think straight. And um, I went off my head. I went 15 years without more than a long weekend off. And I mean that that's not an exaggeration. So you can imagine that without taking any time off, any holidays, that put a strain on my marriage. And I can honestly look back, as I have done for many years now, and now I look back and uh, I, uh, I marvel at the fact that that woman put up with me for so long that she actually stayed with me until she could no longer stay with me. And if I thought my life was bad then, it got so much worse when I had to move out of the family home and live on my own. And that precipitated a, a period of four years of black, black, black depression that I don't ever want to experience and I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And people say to me now that I've been back in Alcoholics Anonymous for 17 years, they say, Ivor, how did you manage not to drink? How did you manage not to do something stupid? And the answer I give is quite simply, it's God. Because you see, th this power that I didn't even have a conception of was watching over me all that time. And when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous in August 2003, because I, I just found it impossible to live life sober, to accept life in life's terms, I came back to that same meeting that I'd previously been an attender at. And the very first night I read how it works. And the first two lines of how it works say, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And I realized there and then that I had not thoroughly followed the A's path. I had pursued, I'd plowed my own furrow even when I was in AA. And for now over eight years, I'd been out there on my own with a little bit of the wisdom and knowledge of Alcoholics Anonymous, but no practical application of its principles. And when I came back to AA in August 2003, I heard things that made me want the sobriety that was an offer in AA so much. Because, you see, I was sick of feeling the way I was feeling. I was sick of what I called crap sobriety. And I threw myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I still had some doubts. I still wasn't 100% convinced that, um, that maybe it was just alcoholism that I was suffering from. I had this idea that I had some unique mental illness that was hitherto undiagnosed. But, you know, when I, when I, when I read the book with the guidance of a sponsor this time and, uh, and I got into We Agnostics, um, and uh, I looked at it and uh, I um, got to page 52 and the bedevilments, uh, reading this at 19 and a half years sober, I, I checked this off in my head. It was like a checklist of it that, that absolutely described me to a T because I was having trouble with personal relationships. I couldn't control my emotional nature. I was a prey to misery and depression. I couldn't make a living. I had a feeling of uselessness. I was unhappy. I couldn't seem to be a real help to other people. That described the spiritual malady that I had been suffering from for years. And I became willing to believe that there was a power, and I could see the evidence of it in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I became willing to believe that if I just threw myself in pursuit of this power, that maybe, just maybe, I would get to be as happy and joyous and free as the people whose sobriety I craved with every fibre of my being. And that's what I began to do. I became an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Since I came back in August 2003, I've never not been in a group. I've never not had a sponsor. And I've became more and more active in my recovery. And um, that belief in this power turned into a decision which I took in step three, which, of course, George is going to talk about later on uh, today. Um, but that belief, that willingness to try something different, that willingness to sack myself 
is the managing director of Ivor.com. That willingness to find this cosmic chief executive and turn my will and my life over, that was the beginning of a, just a wonderful and amazing journey that I've been on for the last 17 years out of my 36. Um, and, you know, so many things have happened, and I'll, I'll, I'll close off in this. Um, I'm grateful to be anywhere these days because in May this year I um, I was taken into hospital and uh, the diagnosis was that at some point in the weeks and months previously I had suffered severe heart failure. Typical alcoholic, you know, no half measures. I couldn't just have a wee bit of heart failure. I had experienced severe heart failure. And, you know, the God that I now uh, have in my life showed to me in those three days in the hospital that he was lovingly shouting at me through a megaphone, Ivor, you need to look after yourself. I've got work for you to do down there. It's been one of the greatest privileges of my life for the last several years to sponsor people through this 12-step program, to become involved at all levels of service, online, in my group, at Intergroup, and especially in the last seven months, to open up two brand new groups, one concentrating on towards emotional sobriety and the other um, on, uh, on studying the big book. And the more that I put into my recovery, uh, the more that I've got out of this. That is my time, and I'm going to be responsible and wrap it up there. But thanks again to Don and the committee for giving me the privilege of coming here and sharing with you. And uh, for all my Scottish friends in the room, how's it going? You all right? Right. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. I'm grateful to be sober. Cheers. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.